This is Dr. J. Welcome to Thesis in 101, where you are worried about a thesis that only four people will ever read. In the previous tutorial, we spoke about the phases of thematic analysis, and we went into a little bit more detail on the first phase, which is familiarizing yourself with data. Now we get to the fun part, which is coding, or indexing. I will use the word coding throughout this tutorial for consistency. In its simplest form, coding is really just assigning a label to text. Here is some sample text. My neighbor's dog dug a hole from their yard to mine and ate my fig tree. If the research question was about pets, I could highlight the word dog and give it a label pet. Dug a hole, which I will call hobbies, and ate my fig tree, which I will assign to diet. However, if the research question was about the behaviors of my neighbors, you could highlight the entire thing and label it careless. At the very least, the code describes the observation the researcher is making, and at the most, it interprets the characteristics of a phenomenon. The process of creating these codes is an approach to sort through large amounts of data in a systematic way, so the data set can be sorted into many codes. Many codes can be summarized into themes, which is just a fancy term for patterns in a data set, and many themes can be interpreted to create insights or meaning. See? Codes themes, insights. As mentioned before, coding can be done inductively, deductively, and of course, a combination of both. Now there are, I want to say, almost complementary approaches to inductive and deductive, namely latent and semantic, but those approaches are more around whether you take the opinions expressed in your dataset at face value, or if you are looking to theorize the meaning behind explicitly stated opinions. I find that most people just do this instinctively based on the research questions, therefore I'll skip those and focus only on what thematic analysis look like depending on your research approach, which is typically deductive or inductive. If you're still not sure what inductive or deductive means, please check out my previous tutorials on the subject. Just for clarification, if your approach to answering your research question is inductive, your coding will be done inductively. If your approach to answering your research question is deductive, as in you are likely using something called a framework, your coding will be done deductively. For the most part, the process of coding is the same whether you are doing it inductively or deductively, but the deductive coding process just have a few extra steps, which I will highlight later in the tutorial. Let's start with inductive. If we are extracting codes from raw data inductively, it means our study is data-driven meaning we don't have any preconceived notions of what codes may come up. Practically, this means all we have is our research questions, our knowledge on the subject, and our data set as inputs into the coding process. Read your transcripts, documents, or whatever data set you have, line by line, and highlight any piece of data that is related to your research question. You may highlight words, sentences, or even entire sections. Highlighted text can belong to one or many codes. These codes or labels can highlight anything from opinions, concepts, behaviors, characteristics of a phenomenon, and so much more. The importance of the text is determined by what you deem relevant as it relates to your research question. Typical, but not the only things to highlight, could be things that you recognize from existing literature. These are easier things to code as you would already have background into these concepts. Even easier to code are things that the interviewee have identified as important, whether explicitly or implicitly. Something else to highlight are things that are repeatedly popping up throughout your dataset. A large chunk of your coding will be dedicated to repeats. Something that I get excited about highlighting is the unexpected concept or opinion or behavior or whatever. Since the point of research is to incrementally contribute to knowledge, I always get excited when I see something that surprises me. Here are a couple of things that are very important to note when coding. Number one, as a researcher, you must immerse yourself in the data and be open to perceiving patterns, else the code you come up with will be limited. Don't make the mistake of dismissing something as unimportant because the data is not showing you what you expected to find. At this stage, you can have a thousand codes if you like. There is no limit to the number of codes you can have. Number two, you don't have to wait until you have all your data before you do coding. For instance, you can do the transcribing and coding after each interview so that you can correct any potential defects in your data collection protocols before you conduct the next interview or collect more documents. This allows you to ensure the relevant data is being collected. 
Number three, when coding, ensure that you do not double count codes. To do this, at the end of the process, review your codes and combine the ones that share the same meaning. If you have a small data set, you can get away with doing coding in a spreadsheet processor such as Excel or Numbers. But if your data set is large or you are dealing with a complex study, I suggest you move on to more sophisticated tools such as NVivo or Atlas TI or any other tool specifically designed for qualitative data analysis. My very biased preference is to use one of these fancy tools because it cuts out any rework of copying and pasting text into different applications, it makes the sorting of data that much more precise, and the quality of your work will just increase. Since this tutorial isn't tool specific, I will show you how to do coding in Excel so you can get an idea of what coding looks like. If this is your text from interviews or documents you collected, you can add the emergent code in a separate column. Emergent code mean the label that you give your code. If the statement belongs to multiple emergent codes, repeat the statement in a different row and add the new emergent code. This way you will be able to sort and pivot your data once your coding is completed. Of course, if you're working in a proper tool, you wouldn't have to do any duplication of text because you would be able to add as many codes to the same text as needed. I also like to add reflective memos when I am coding, which includes any initial analytical interest I generated during the first phase, which is familiarizing myself with data, as discussed in the previous tutorial, and of course any new insights I am gaining while coding. These reflective memos assist in formulating the story you want to eventually tell the reader. Yes, developing your report is the last phase of thematic analysis, but it is a good practice to start thinking about what you want to commit to paper come the end of this process now. At this point, also take the opportunity to take an initial stab at identifying potential significant statements. These are the statements you will lift and shift from your dataset into your report to support your findings. Don't forget to add who made the statements. Again, this will come in very handy at the report writing stage. Now let's move on to doing coding deductively. As mentioned before, deductive coding is pretty much the same as inductive coding with just a few extra steps. I'll point them out to you as I go through the process so it's easy for you to build on the knowledge you have accumulated throughout the inductive coding section of this tutorial. A deductive approach is considered researcher driven as you the researcher will look at raw data with a specific lens. This specific lens is called a framework. If you don't know what a framework is, please check out my series on frameworks and how to use it. To use a framework when coding, we must first create a codebook. The development of the codebook is one of the extra steps I was referring to. Essentially, you would like to create a codebook before you even do any data collection. That way you can be assured that you will collect all the necessary data for your study. But for now, let's just focus on how to develop a codebook and of course how to use it when coding. A codebook is literally a guide for the researchers so that they can recognize a code when they see it in a transcript. Think of it as you're picking up someone at the airport whom you've never met before. So before you get there, they send you a text saying, Hey, I will be the man who is wearing the pink coat and the red father Christmas socks. With that description, it will be easier for you to recognize a person when you see them. And that recognition is the idea behind the codebook. In order for you to use a codebook as a guide, each code should at a minimum have a label, a definition of what the code entails, and a description of how the researcher will know when the code exists. For example, this is a framework. It's a strategic alignment model, well, my version of it in any case. To create a codebook, first look at each construct in your framework. You may have heard the term variable, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I will use the term construct for consistency. Depending on the complexity of the framework, your codebook could have a label, definition, and description for these constructs only. If there are elements within each construct of your framework, like the example on screen now, you may want to develop your codebook at element level. Use the lowest level possible of your framework to develop your codebook, as that will give you the greatest chance of ensuring that you are covering all the aspects of your framework. As a demonstration of how to develop a codebook, we are going to use the main construct digital business strategy as an example. Since we would want to use the lowest level of our framework, each element within this main construct will be considered a construct on its own in the codebook. To reiterate, the codebook requires three basic things, a label, a definition, and a description. The element name can be used as the label in the codebook. 
The definition is a summary of what you have seen in literature on what the specific construct mean, and the description of the construct is the specific things to look out for in order to recognize this particular code in the dataset. When you first develop your codebook, you may find it difficult to differentiate between the definition and the description, but as you become more familiar with your framework and your data, this will become clearer to you. A word of caution, write the definition and description as you understand it. I've seen too many students copy and paste from other authors and then still don't know what to look for in their datasets. Remember when I said deductive coding is pretty much the same as inductive coding, just with a few extra steps? Well, here's another extra step. Once you have developed the codebook, do the coding of the transcripts the same way you would if you are doing an inductive study, as in have an open mind to perceive codes and label the text as you see fit. What is extra in this process is adding the codebook label to your emergent code. For instance, in this dataset we identify two codes inductively branding, and first to market. We now have to further categorize these codes to match our codebook. If you look at the definition and description of each construct, you will see that the codes branding and first to market falls under the codebook code distinctive competencies. You may ask yourself, why is this necessary? The guys who did the inductive coding didn't have to go through all this trouble, so what benefit does this extra categorization do? Also, why can't I just use the codebook code in the first place? First, we do not use the codebook code because it is just too high level. Qualitative data is rich and full of insights. Reducing this to a few constructs that is in your codebook is not going to help you with gaining insights and making that incremental contribution to knowledge. So we code inductively so that we can categorize our data in such a way that it gives us the best chance at telling a story. Now let's move on to why we need to do the extra steps of matching our emergent codes with our codebook codes. Benefit number one, this can help you with identifying any gaps in your research. A deductive approach to research starts with a theory. This means to maintain the golden thread in your thesis or dissertation, you must at all times match your research progress to theory. If you don't know what the golden thread is, please check out my series on the subject. Since your codebook has been developed based on your framework, which by the way can be seen as a summary of your theory, when you match your emergent codes with your codebook and you notice that a codebook code does not have any or has a few emergent codes linked to it, it usually represents two things. One, either you fail to recognize and highlight the important text in your data set covering the theory, or more devastatingly, you didn't collect all the necessary data to address that construct. And it is for this reason that it is beneficial for you to do your data collection and data analysis iteratively so that you can course correct if necessary. The second benefit to matching your emergent codes to codebook codes is that it gives you an extra layer of data and information organization. This means summarizing your codes and themes and your themes into a story will be much easier to do. The third benefit is to help identify surprises. Surprises make for good stories and they are very important to the incremental contribution of knowledge. These surprises can even lead to updating the framework that you are using. Consider the case of the technology acceptance model, which is a framework. It started off with four constructs and as time went by and researchers delved into the subject, they ended up identifying more constructs and more dependencies because they could recognize the surprises in their data. I just want to reiterate. The approach you take with coding is linked to your research approach. You don't get to choose to do an inductive coding approach because it seems like the easier option. And that's it for me today. If you have comments or questions, just pop them into the comment section. I do reply to every single one of them. Like this, share this, subscribe to this. This is Dr. J signing off.